and collect it in the Galapagos. <laughs> Ten minutes. No, it has to be longer than that. Like 20. For the first time you ask, I think it's five minutes. Yeah. That was a super fun trip. Not that size. Oh yeah, that's when we put Chippy on. There's Chippy. It's a hydraulic jackhammer. Didn't really have enough uh, flow to work properly, but I get it. It needed like the full. It needed like the full five, five GPM, and we just couldn't give it give it to it. Yeah. I must, I must have shown you this photo. I must have shown you this photo. <laughs> this is... We have some viewers wondering if we are surfacing or headed down, and actually neither. Uh, we're still mid-dive, actually doing a mid-water transect to another part, <clears throat> excuse me, another part of Seamount F um, that we have been exploring for just over 12 hours now. Um, so we've probably got about another hour of blue water till we get to the next part of our exploration where we will continue our way up to the summit of a seamount. We'll probably start at about 2,700 meters in depth, and we'll work our way up to the summit of the seamount that's at 1,700 meters depth. So, working our way over to a new part of the seamount. Pardon? Oh, yeah.
So Ashley, I've got a question for you. Um, we have someone writing in who's a student, said they're really interested in deep sea science and wondering how they can get more involved in that. And if there's any sorts of courses, um, especially college type courses that you would encourage that they take, and maybe Steve, you can help too, but I thought it might be helpful to hear from you since you're our ocean science intern of kind of how you got there and if you had any ideas of classes that might be helpful for them to get more involved in deep sea science? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. Um, so for me, it kind of started when I was in high school also and I learned how to scuba dive. And that was a really big factor in like what made me want to do science in general. Um, and so throughout college, um, I just took classes related to mostly environmental science, but I did take a class in marine ecology and that was really amazing. So anything uh, with marine science, like marine ecology, oceanography, um, even anything like GIS can help out with uh, a lot of the stuff that, that, that navigation does is mapping. Um, so that's really helpful. I would also recommend just reading a lot. So if you like to read uh, about science or science news, there's a great site called Ocean Bites. And uh, pretty much every week there, there will be a couple new articles that are posted about uh, marine science in general, and it's really, really easy to read. It's um, by a lot of graduate students from around the U.S. and around the world who just kind of condense the latest scientific articles on marine science and make them very easy to read. Um, yeah, also just listening to podcasts. I love listening to ologies. That's a that's a great one, and Me too. there are tons out there. So, yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, I'm gonna do it like this. It's just easier. Steve, how about you? Do you have any uh, advice for someone who wants to get involved yeah, in good to know. sciences? And how do you do that? And then specifically, um, someone wondering what courses you would recommend. Yep. Yeah, I do have a few courses. Um, for um, you know, a lot of what we're seeing down here, if you're interested in the biology of it, I strongly recommend an invertebrate zoology course. So it gives you a, a survey, an overview of all the different types of biological diversity that we find down here. Um, if fishes are more your thing, you know, maybe a course in fish ecology would might be a good place to start. Um, but for me, invertebrate zoology was by far the most exciting course um, that I took as an undergrad. Uh, sometimes they're associated with some field work too, um, you know, out outside excursions and such. Um, but yeah, definitely the the ability to identify and classify things, um, even when you might not know uh, or memorize all of the different types of life we find in the deep sea, how, how to find the information is really valuable. Um, also, uh, you know, exciting courses I've both taught and uh, taken would be something like introduction to oceanography, um, trying to get an interdisciplinary interdisciplinary understanding of uh, how the ocean works uh, from a chemical, physical, biological um, perspective. Really, really valuable. Um, and then you can go from there because that's kind of like a, an entry course. You can start to decide what types of questions and pathways might interest you most. Great answers. Thank you. I have to pull for that invert zoology course too. I am an engineer and have taken a lot of engineering courses, but I the evolutionary biology courses have been super memorable, That the ones that I took, um, and really helped to understand what we're seeing down here. Like, And most of the front row sits around during these dives and like tries to learn how to ID these creatures and understand where they fit in the history of evolution. So evolutionary biology is a really good one, even if you're going into something else. Yeah, it's kind of like we get firsthand classes in here. You know, we get to see things yeah, firsthand. Yeah, it's really fun. Sitting next to scientists and hearing you explain it, so pretty lucky. Yeah, and I feel like I'm learning a lot from Steve just by sitting next <laughs> to him, so. <laughs> Absorbing all I, of your knowledge. I learned yep. the same way by, you know, listening to people on 
um, you know, in the early days of the Okeanos Explorer, when they had a science chat in 2013, there was deep sea TV, and uh, <laughs> I would, you know, have that on in my office, you know, to the to one side, and uh, just like absorb what was coming through the chat. It was extremely valuable, and I Say started again? to learn specifics about, you know, oh, facts yeah. about the stuff that we were seeing. Um, yeah, I, I just switch Hercules. Deep sea biology is not exactly it's a it. Correct, subject so. matter that is often specifically addressed in uh, invertebrate zoology, but you know, you learn practical skills too. Good. Yeah, I don't think there were deep sea classes available to me in my undergraduate. Um, and so it's nice to know that there's, you know, a lot of other biology type classes that you can transfer that knowledge uh, to this new environment. Yep. Yeah, I mean, also, you know, if I could do it again, I would probably go back and maybe do a few more courses in um, you know, evolutionary ecology, um, even courses in uh, genetics or genomics uh, would be really valuable, getting a handle on those kind of, um, you know, r more general subject matters that you could then apply to a research question in deep sea uh, would be very valuable. But I really enjoyed the background that I obtained um, kind of as an inter interdisciplinary oceanography student. We've got another good question here. So someone's writing in, and they are a natural science illustrator, wondering, have any of the scientists on board worked with illustrators before to help communicate their research? And we've definitely had all sorts of different artists on board. We have one right now, actually, one of our science communication fellows, Abrian, um, is an illustrator, cartographer, um, and she writes graphic novels. And she's helping to kind of tell the story of the Nautilus and the work that we do I'm kind of on a broader scale, and we've definitely had different artists in the past. I don't know if we have specific examples. Maybe, Steve, you know of any of um, illustrators working directly with the scientists about their specific research? Yeah, in, uh, in 2014, um, we had a fantastic illustrator, uh, I think from Connecticut, uh, Karen Ramona Young. And she was out with us and did a little, uh, she's kind of like a doodler draws little images of uh, you know, what's going on with the vehicles. I think some of those doodles might actually be up on the website or you know, it might be through available through her own website. Um, who else? We had, we've had artists out at sea before. Um, so Beth on the last cruise had a, Beth was one of the lead scientists on the last cruise, had an awesome illustration that she hired a scientific illustrator to do. Um, that everybody was into. She ended up emailing out to all of us for to sort of illustrate all like the complexities of life forms um, in the areas she was looking. So I know that scientists are always looking for good ways to to communicate their ideas because your research is really only as good as what you can what you can explain to people. Yeah, graphics are important. And we can definitely plug the Science Communication Fellowship as an opportunity. Um, if you're interested in coming out to see, uh, we'll probably have applications open again sometime in the next year or two. We're a little bit behind due to just COVID delays, but that's something to be on watch for. Um, and we open up when we open up those applications, it's on nautiluslive.org. Um, but we've had a lot of different types of science communicators. Um, so illustrators and artists are definitely people we like to get out on the ship, so definitely be watching for that. Yeah, for folks, even for folks who are interested in sciences, um, you know, it's really important these days to have good graphical um, abilities. Uh, more and more journals are asking for graph graphical abstracts uh, that help display, you know, your science in um, more simple terms so that you can understand it without having to read through the, the text. Um, yeah, I think uh, hugely valuable, either working alongside illustrators 
uh, or you know having those skills for yourself. It's really neat to see the evolution of how people are communicating their science, even in the last decade. And I've seen that a lot in different at conferences with posters too. How people have really changed and evolved away from. You know, no one wants to sit and read tons of text. <laughs> you know, you want to yeah. be able to quickly understand what you're looking at. So it's really neat to see the creativity that's coming out in the sciences. Ship's moving um, more south than I want it to. So, and we're gonna hit the wrong ridge. So, I want to adjust it to the west. Yeah, we're gonna hit the totally wrong ridge. I'm just going to change its bearing to where are we right now? Yeah, I'm going to change our bearing to 280 and see how that sets us up. Bridge, nav. Uh, we're tracking a bit south. Can you change the bearing to 280? Um, can you just track at 280? 
For those of you who may just be tuning in, getting a lot of questions about whether we are ascending or descending. Um, and we're actually still in the middle of our dive. Um, we are doing a mid-water tow over to uh, another part of the seamount that we've been exploring on this dive. We started diving just over 12 hours ago, and we've been exploring the flank of an unnamed seamount, Seamount F. Um, and so we started at about 3,300 meters and moved up to about 2,700 meters in depth. And now we are towing Hercules and Argus over to another part of the seamount um, where we'll continue exploring. And similar to our previous dives, we're really trying to understand um, the seamount chain and taking some rock collections to better understand the age of these vol underwater volcanoes or seamounts um, and iron manganese crust composition as well as looking at some deep sea corals and sponge um, ecosystems. So characterizing um, the different species that we're seeing and taking some samples along the way. So similar to our previous two dives on this expedition, um, but we're on a new seamount. So thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Um, we're not, yeah, we're not bringing the ROVs up quite yet, but we do have, yeah, we are straight on blue water. Um, while we were mapping the last couple of days, there was a strong surface southerly current the entire time, and he had to have this like funny heading on the line. Um, so that's immediately what I thought of. We'll have to adjust again. We'll see where this gets us. Looks like the same thing's happening again. Yeah. Yeah, this is where I put the move in. Yeah. About four minutes ago. Let's give it five minutes. Might be taking a while to register. Looks like we did this, came back down, now we're doing this again. It still might bias more westerly than the last move. Yeah. Yeah, I did 280, assuming that we'd probably go 270 or so. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Look. So we'll see. Something. Something funny and a little bit more north of west. Yeah. I definitely don't want to land on the wrong, that Pat, southern yes. ridge. Yes, yeah. that definitely don't. Okay. I don't want to get, I want to be over here. Right. Uh, but we're not fighting against current or anything, or at least the, this current. There it goes. Nice. Let's 
see how long it takes Argus to respond. Then I'll have you lay back answer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when are we? I mean, uh... <laughs> <laughs> He's moving quite quickly right now. Yeah, you can feel it, like, right when we called in the move. Yeah, we have max autos on the stern. Or max thrust. I don't know why I said autos. Oh, wow. Actually, a lot. Yeah. Argus just started kiting up a little more. Steve, I've got a question for you. And listeners, feel free to send in your questions. We've got 40 more minutes or so of blue water. <laughs> but is there a reason we start low and work up the seamount as opposed to working down slope? Yeah, it's uh, it's easier to start down slope and work up slope because we can see more of the seafloor. As if we were moving down slope, we would have to point the camera down slope and significant amount of the frame would be blue water, so looking out. So we get a better view of the seafloor. Also, it helps us um, avoid hazards, mm. potentially. Makes sense. If we can see upslope with the sonar as we know what's coming ahead of us, there won't be any surprises. Plus, it's fun to end on the summit, you know? Yeah. yeah. Work We're your peak way up. baggers. Exactly. <laughs> Deep sea peak baggers. <laughs> and somehow, for all the precautions, there still managed to be surprises. So <laughs> stack the odds in your favor. <laughs> and that's a, that's a watch name I can get behind. <laughs> yeah, that is a good watch name. Peak <laughs> baggers? The deep sea peak baggers. Oh, I like that. more inclusive for those of us who don't live on Vancouver Island. <laughs> no, the Eastern Seas <laughs> you are your own included. Call out. <laughs> your, your name is in the water. Yeah, but we all know what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> Steve's been holding in some bitterness for days. It's just now coming wow. out. <laughs> I had no idea. Trying to work towards watch cohesion here. I don't want to be in the way of that. No, I, li I like it. I like Bring peak baggers together. a lot. It's good. Navas looks really weird. Uh, he may just need to adjust his heading. Um, the try. Let's see here. Yeah, I mean, he, if he's fighting really hard, the best thing for him to do is to just play with his heading a little bit. Like, I'd probably try and put my heading to like 110 or 120, right? Because then that's going to get him going. 
hopefully in the right direction, but. So he's going to hold, then he's going to change his heading, and then he's going to restart it. I would probably put his heading to like 120. We'll see what he chooses. I mean, we can always hop over the ridge too, right? Like if we need to. That's that's a parry that you're dealing with there, for sure. <laughs> Don't, I just the only part I don't like about this is like I don't want to stop the momentum of the ship. Any chance to zoom in that, or is it going to go too uh, too fast? So yeah. I hope he doesn't wait till the ship completely stops its motion. It's just we don't we don't want to stop completely and then restart. It's sort of. I mean, although we'll still be laid back most likely, but I mean, they can change their heading on the fly. I've seen them do that. Well. A viewer wondering how many people are normally on the ship and we can have up to 50 people on the ship um, and it's usually pretty full and that is because we've got about 17 or 18 people typically working on our crew so our captain crew uh, taking care of the ship and then just over 30 people usually on our science team that includes um, our scientists and our video engineers rov pilots navigators science communicators, um, and all sorts of people on that team. So we've got a lot of different types out here, but we can we can have up to 50. Got another question coming in. Do we know if there is an active lava flow under any of these seamounts? 
As far as we know, they're not. Yeah, they haven't been for quite a while. There's no evidence of any recent type of um, extrusive volcanism or anything like that. Yeah, most of these are millions and millions of years old. Probably tens, <laughs> tens of millions, yeah, since anything's happened. But there are active volcanoes under the water in different there parts are. of the world. Yep. Just not where we are looking right now. Yeah, we were just talking about one last night that sounded pretty cool. The one with the reefs on top. Yeah. Not that wasn't active, but more recent because it has an atoll still on top. Hasn't completely sunk below the waves. Um, there's active volcanoes in the Caribbean underwater. In fact, Nautilus visited, visited them in the past. You just put in a one eight zero heading. Yeah, it's a little... Okay, Steve, I've got another question for you. What are the oxygen levels at the seafloor? Do, so do we, are we measuring that in we any are. capacity? Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, we, we measured them. So we haven't moved too much off of uh, where we were at the seafloor uh, recently, depth. Um, so oxygen concentration can be measured in a few different ways. Uh, you can measure absolute concentrations, um, you know, in terms of micromoles per liter or milligrams per liter or milliliters per liter. Uh, we usually stick to the oceanographic standard of micromolars, uh, micromoles per liter. And right now it's at about 110 um, micromoles per liter. And then we also have uh, the ability to measure uh, percent saturation, which some people like to use. Um, right now we're at oxygen saturation at about 26%. And relative to um, shallower waters, would you say that's you know, more? Is there it's, more or less oxygen? It's it uh, about half. Okay. About okay. half, yeah. So surf surface ocean oxygen concentrations are somewhere around 200, 250, something like that, micromoles. So I would imagine then a lot of these organisms that we're looking at have adapted to pretty low oxygen. 
yeah, environments, or maybe not adapted to, but can survive in. Yeah, it, it's even not really that low from an oceanographic perspective. Um, we really don't start getting into um, very stress. Well, it depends on where you are geographically, but we typically don't get into stressful levels until we drop below maybe 50 micromolar, something like that. Okay. Um, and then even at the most extreme end, uh, you know, in like an oxygen minimum zone, um, or some of the more extreme oxygen minimum zones on the planet, you typically don't get um, to those concentrations until you're under 25 micromolar. Uh, but even, I know I've, I've observed and worked on uh, systems in those OMZs uh, where you still find corals living at you know, sub 10 micromolar concentrations of oxygen. It's, um, it depends a lot on what the uh, variability of those systems are. Um, do they experience, for example, you know, some sort of uh, variability in the oxygen environment due to internal tides or um, you know, in internal waves or tides? Uh, are there different hydrodynamic uh, effects of water impinging on the seamount that might result in um, some fluidity of the oxygen ma minimum layer boundaries? Um, some of these are kind of open questions, but we know that you know, there are corals that live at, you know, one to five micromolar oxygen concentrations. Uh, not many, but they're, they're there, they exist. We've seen them, we've done some genetics on them, but it's generally stressful for most things. Is there anything we can learn from any of those organisms that live in those extreme environments and I don't know use that in understanding you know there's a lot of issues of hypoxia in surface levels or surface waters I should say um, is anyone thinking about that in their research or is that not really relevant just because they're such different environments they're similar in that you know the, the stressors are similar but typically um, the hypoxia that most people are probably familiar with is something that's more seasonal okay. um, that may not be persistent in in an oxygen minimum zone environment there's usually some persistence to where the OMZ occurs um, you know usually several hundred meters of depth sometimes thickness um, that may go up and down you know with seasonality but it's it's fairly persistent so animals that live on the benthos in those areas have to cope with that all the time. Yeah, interesting. And, and some have actually. Uh, Go ahead. Um, Sorry. And I was gonna say that some of them have actually really succeeded on that in that um, they have become finely attuned to the presence of the OMZ, where oh. you have migrators, for example. Uh, um, migrating organisms might spend um, time in the oxygen minimum zone to avoid predation because a lot of predators need lots of oxygen and uh, they typically will not hunt and forage um, much in the OMZs since they're more stressful for them. That's a big advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Oh. Ashley, I imagine some of the work that you're looking at deals with some seasonal hypoxia and issues like that? Um, yeah, so that's something that I will sort of be looking at uh, during for my master's project. Um, I'll be looking at a couple of nutrient concentrations in uh, local aquatic ecosystems around Vancouver Island, um, focusing primarily on the ones that come from urbanization just seeing how that uh, might affect the local environments. Yeah, That's interesting stuff.
So we had to switch ships or ships to keep going up, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. For those of you who are just joining us and wondering what we are doing right now, uh, we are doing a mid-water tow over to a new part of the seamount that we have been exploring on this dive. We started diving just over 12 hours ago um, on an unnamed seamount, Seamount F, and we finished our first transect. That was a 3.8 kilometers long, uh, moving upslope, and now we are towing Hercules and Argus over to another part of the seamount um, where we will start exploring. We have been towing for about an hour and 45 minutes, so we are getting closer to that uh, target location to start the next upslope transect of this dive. Um, but that's what we're doing. We're not pulling out the ROVs yet, uh, just moving them to a different part of the seamount. And a couple of people wondering how much longer we'll be in transit for. Kate, do you have any idea? About how much longer you think we'll be relatively um yeah we did a little bit of a course adjustment so it's taking a little bit longer than originally anticipated um off the i would say to count on about an hour or so more great thank you 45 minutes hour yeah okay. we'll be optimistic <laughs> still some fun little things floating by though looks like there's a little like red jellies that have come by. I think is what they were. They go by so quick.
Out of you are wondering, is this area a really old lava flow? And yes, it is. Uh, we can't currently see the seafloor, but these deep sea mountains that we're looking at um, are old lava flows or old volcanoes um, that we think are millions of years old. Um, and part of what we're doing is trying to better understand uh, the age of these different deep sea mounts. So we've been collecting different rock samples along the way um, that we will try to date and better kind of understand um, at all of these different sea mounts. So we've collected a few rocks already, and when we get back down to the deep sea floor in a bit, you'll be able to see um, that old volcanic rock. But for now, we've got blue water. Um, they're always looking at the high pack. Um, I don't know if they have the ability to see or to pull up NavG, but they do look at high pack and then the multi-beam computer or the multi-beam acquisition. And my guess is on that, they probably have a KVM to shuffle through. I think they have a video router too, so they can see. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. They probably have one monitor on high pack and one on the feed. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, one way to definitely change that is to just change the color of the track line for the Nautilus. You know, to be like, yeah. Got a question from a viewer about where they would be able to find um, the results of these aging processes of, or aging results of the rocks that we um, collect. And if you go to nautiluslive.org, we actually have a publications page. Um, and you can look through our past publications um, for really many years back, actually. Um, so a lot of our data and science and publications can be found there. You can sort through them by authors or by type. Um, or specific expedition legs. So if you want to come back and look in the future for this specific expedition leg, um, we'll have that posted on this web page. So that's a great way to keep track of where our research goes um, after the cruise, because we do a lot of work on land um, and then later published. So it's a good thing to keep in mind.